Okay, so I'm just booting the computer that we're going to be installing Linux from scratch on. Um, it didn't actually come up on the screen grabber just then, but the um, video is displaying some peculiar artifacts. Um, and even, I don't know if it's been picked up, even on the screen I'm looking at, I can see some sort of wire patterns going across the screen. Um, so, yeah, what I said on my slides about having hardware that's reliable, this has been reliable like, while I've been testing this, but it seems as the video is having issues. Um, I did have issues with the network adapter that's built into the motherboard, um, and I thought it might be to do with the power supply, but I tested the power supply and it seems to be all up to spec, so I'm wondering if there's something a bit more. Um, to do with the motherboard itself, being as the video is uh, not 100% either, but hopefully it will stand up for the duration of these videos and it won't give up on me too early. So this bit takes a bit of time for some reason. Um, I'm not sure whether the boot program has defaulted the CD drive to um, the minimum speed or if the computer is um, under heavy use uncompressing this init disk of which I, I don't think is probably the case being as it's a fairly contemporary machine for its time um, I guess it's because the CD drive has been scaled down to a uh, standard speed Although it does sound like it's moving fairly fast, it's not certainly not moving at its top speed. It's a, um, a more modern DVD drive. Yeah, it is a DVD drive. Yeah, from about, um, I guess, mid-2000s. So it's certainly capable of transferring data faster. As I, say, I imagine, it's because it has been cycled down to the lowest speed purely for compatibility reasons, I guess, to make sure that the bootloader loads correctly. Um, as you'll see later on, when it's installing the packages and actually reading off the CD, it you know, behaves at a, what, what I'd consider to be a normal speed for a CD. So while that's loading, I'll also mention that the installation process can be a little bit pernickety. Um, it's not like, for example, Debian, where you just put answer, you know, two or three questions and various assumptions are made about other stuff that are sane and you end up with an installation that's more or less what you want. Um, this asks questions as you go along as you'd expect, but unless you just accept the defaults or what would be deemed to be defaults, um, you can end up either coming across bugs or well I guess they are all bugs um, but the bugs can be simple things such as the first one we'll see is the key map you set the key map but when you boot the installed system it hasn't taken any notice of that key map that you set um, but then there are other things where you can end up either in a loop and you can't seem to get out of doing what you're trying to do or something fails with an error message um, and it just generally misbehaves. So I've got to try and be very careful when I'm doing the install because I'm not going to be just accepting the defaults, um, especially around the partitioning. Also with the package selection, I've found that the package selection, if you try and tweak that during the installation, it can, yeah, the video has just lost signal again and it's come back again. Um, yeah, if you try to adjust the package selection during the installation, that can cause problems where it, I don't know, loses count of the CDs that you've put in or loses track of them. So I found that with with the package selections, not to touch it, just accept the defaults, install the system, and then go back and um, adjust any packages you want to install or remove. So as I was going to see how I get on because um, I'm not going to be using the defaults. Um, I'm going to be setting up the system with a view to possibly doing 
other older Linux from scratch versions in the future. Um, I haven't decided if it's worth doing. There are several other problems involved with that, which I've identified. Um, so it'll be something I'll be looking at uh, probably in the new year um, to see if that's worth doing or not. So yeah, I'll be setting up a partitioning to take that into account. Um, so it won't be standard. And the installation can get confused as to what you're trying to do if you're not careful about what what um, options you do and in, and in what order. So I think this is nearly loaded. Okay, maybe that pause in the video was just part of the init disk being initialized, possibly. Um, it didn't seem to have happened again. Bear in mind, this, uh, what you're watching is off a, an analog signal. It's out of the VGA 15 pin um, output. So any quirks on that analog signal are going to be reflected directly. And picked up. Right, it's got to be nearly finished now. Okay, here we go. Right, so the, I believe these selections are partly to do with the interface that we're going to be negotiating here and to do with the installation. So I want English color display. It might seem a bit of a strange question, but you've got to bear in mind that at that time there were still motherboards around that had dip switches or jumpers on the motherboard to select the type of um, video card that was installed um, or more to the point the type of monitor that was installed um, and I can't remember the exact reasons but I believe it's something to do with how uh, what sort of a um, video adapter you had some in the original days of the IBM, some adapters are either low-res color or high-res monochrome, depending on the usage of the PC. So if you're doing, for example, charts and things, something graphical, you'd have a color but low-res display. Whereas if you're doing, say, word processing, you'd have a high-resolution monochrome display for clear characters on the screen. Um, but I guess around this time is probably when this started to become a bit more redundant, but it's still something that... Um, would need to be set on in certain hardware. So English UK, so this is the key map that gets ignored. So if I installed it as it is, I'd end up with, I think, the US keyboard as default rather than what I chose. So um, over the years, I've worked out that the way to get around this or to fix this is to go back into settings and reselect the key map. And that will now remember that setting when we go to the start installation. Um, if you're installing on a machine with SCSI or a network card that's not directly supported, you need to go into kernel modules. And with the floppy boot, you'll have to install the modules disk. Um, and uh, with the CD-ROM, I believe it just loads directly off the CD-ROM. It's a lot, obviously a lot more convenient. One other thing I should mention that, um, if I haven't mentioned already, about the boot images, there are several floppy boot images. There's the two that um, come in the box, uh, which are the two images on the Internet Archive. Uh, and from memory, I believe there are other um, boot images. There's, I think there's two EIDE images, and the second one's got other chipsets um, on there that are less generic. There's a SCSI boot one, which I presume would have the default SCSI modules built in, so you wouldn't have to select them manually afterwards. And there may be an, uh, a fifth image. So I think there's five 
floppy boot images so if you are having trouble getting hardware working um, it's worth taking a look at those and in um, tandem with that as well as generically if you're having problems getting the installation to go through as you want or trying to find the right um, hardware drivers or selection or whatever uh, there's a very good help file on the first CD um, it's several hundred pages long um, which you can print out it's the book that you know comes in the box um, for this particular version a lot of it looks like it's been lifted um, in fact one of the chapters as I remember looks like it's been lifted from the kernel documentation because it is all about the drivers and how to configure them so for example with the SCSI card you're going to need the address the interrupt and possibly other information uh, to configure and that needs to be configured on the kernel command line uh, and sent to the module uh, to configure the, the SCSI card correctly for the I imagine the plug and play possibly um, so there's all that all, all that sort of information in there, what sort of hardware drivers are supported by the kernel and so on. So it's, it's a really good bit of documentation. Um, there's also stuff on there about generic Linux. It's, you know, I, I did learn some stuff from there when I was trying to learn about Linux. Um, stuff about the kernel, stuff about SUE, stuff about YAST, which is the program you're looking at now or a modified form of it. Um, YAST is yet another setup tool, um, which... I, believe on the modern versions of SUE still exists in some form or another and it's quite a good system where it's a menu driven system for managing the system you don't in theory have to go and edit um, config files manually or type commands into install or delete packages you can do it all from within this menuing environment so it's quite a useful tool, tool to have especially to a beginner which I think is one of the things that endeared me to SUE's initially even though I tended to like Red Hat a lot more, Suze was just a little bit easier to use. Okay, the video's dropped out there again, so it is an issue. It's not anything to do with drivers loading. So let's get on with the installation. Um, so I need to press start there, start installation. So I just press enter. And again, start installation. And we're booting from the CD-ROM. So you can see it's going to mount it there. You can see it's loading 11 megabytes pretty rapidly. So it makes me wonder about that initial boot. Why is it why is it so slow? So install Linux from scratch. Rather ironically, that's the name of the menu option. Obviously, it means Linux from scratch in a more generic term. So I press enter there. So I want to do partitioning to partition the hard disk and here you can see there's two devices come up there are two disks in this machine I'm going to be installing to HDA um, the HDA device um, now you might be wondering what, what is HDA well back in time before um, SATA came out uh, EIDE it was then known or um, Integrated Drive Electronics, I think it stands for, uh, or PATA, or, well, it was used to be known as ATA, which was actually the standard, uh, the interface standard, and then subsequently became to be known as PATA to dis discriminate it between the serial and parallel forms. Back in those days, there was MFM, SCSI, SD, and IDE. Um, the SCSI were the devices that were called SDA, the S was SCSI, I imagine. Um, SD, I'm not sure about. I presume they were the same as SCSI because they're kind of a similar technology in a way, but not the same, if you know what I mean. I guess it looked similar to the system um, as SCSI did. But IDE was more like MFM, um, and SCSI, uh, MFM and IDE got the terminology HD, I imagine, for hard disk or some, some such thing. Um, but when the uh, SATA drives came out, SATA was actually similar functionally to SCSI, so its drivers are based on SCSI, SCSI drivers, so SATA drives were referred to as SD, 
uh, devices. And I think, I think I'm right in saying now that the parallel devices are also come under that SCSI um, device hierarchy as well. So that's what you're looking at is um, a device that refers to either an MFM or an IDE, a parallel IDE device. So that's what's in this machine. Um, are actually EIDEs, enhanced IDE drives. Um, and that's that's why they appear as HDA and not SDA because that concept of a, an IDE drive um, having its driver as part of the SCSI subsystem didn't exist. It was a completely separate driver in the kernel. So I want to do some partitioning here. So on that disk, HDA, the first disk, so I press enter there. And you can see on this screen here, F disk is running in the background. I'm just going to press enter because it looks like some of the uh, enter on the screen grabber just to refresh the screen as it looks like the no, okay, so it looks like, I don't know if you can make that out, the K is a bit fuzzy there. And here also it looks a bit fuzzy, so it looks like it is a problem with the video card, it's nothing to do with the grabber. But anyway, it says, uh, as you can see, F-Disc is running in the background behind this menuing system, and it's picked up that this disc is, well, it's a, a large disc, and you can see there's potentially a problem here. Um... Well, first of all, it says it's not a valid DOS partition. That's because it's blank and it's going to create a new DOS disk label. So basically, this is an MBR, what we now know is an MBR, um, a Microsoft boot record, I believe that stands for. So I can't use the mouse. I have to use a keyboard to scroll down there. No, I don't know. How. Oh, F6, it says down the bottom. So I press F6, there's complete. Well, it calls it an error message. It's more like a warning, the first bit. Um, so it doesn't matter that the contents and the previous contents on the disk won't be recoverable because it's a blank disk anyway. Then we've got another mes message saying the number of cylinders of the disk is set to 97226. This is larger than 1024 and may cause problems with software that runs at boot time. For example, Lilo. Lilo is the stands for Linux loader. It's... Um, it was the standard Linux um, boot program for booting Linux systems at the time. You've already seen, I think it's SysLinux it's called, which is still used or can still be used for booting CDs. I believe that's another one that can be used to boot operating systems. But Lilo, um, this I believe was before Grub even existed. I think it's still a few years before Grub emerged as a far superior boot system. Um, so yeah, that, that's the boot system that we'll be installing. Um, and it says also booting and partitioning software from other OSs like DOS FDisk and OS FDisk. So I am actually going to create a partition for DOS. Um, I'm contemplating doing something in DOS on this machine as well. So as it suggests there, if you try to do what we're going to do here in DOS, it just wouldn't allow it at all. It hasn't got the capability. Uh, to do what we're going to do. OS2, I haven't used that in years and years. Um, I can't remember how capable that was in terms of partitioning, so I can't comment on that off the top of my head. Um, so the important thing to bear in mind is the fact that Lilo cannot boot a system that's outside of this 1024 cylinder range. And generally, at the time, I believe that that meant a disk that was anything normally greater than eight gigabytes. Um, so this disk is 80 gigabytes. So it is a problem that we're going to have to bear in mind and ensure that the boot disk uh, is not outside that range. So I'll press enter to get rid of that message. And what we've got down here is the options. There's a help option there. There's two disabled options there because they're not appropriate at the moment. F5 to create a partition. F6 is the option I just took to view the errors. So F5 to create a partition. I'm going to create a primary partition. So I'll just press enter. And I'll use the first one, HDA1. Press enter again. Then it wants to know what cylinders I want to allocate. Well, this is F disk behind here. So you can enter values as you would do uh, with FDisk. So I'll just accept the default, the first cylinder, 
bear in mind on modern dash disks you're dealing with megabytes by default not cylinders so when you see cylinder one here that is literally at the beginning of the disk when you're dealing with megabytes you're normally leaving a gap at the beginning i can't remember why that is now i think it's for boundaries for cylinder boundaries uh for improved performance as, as i remember um obviously i'm talking about spinning disks here not um, ssds um so yeah that's something to bear in mind this is a different numbering system here end partition well the first partition i want to create is a dos partition so i'm just going to create um an eight megabyte dos partition sorry not eight megabyte um i'll create a one gigabyte partition so i need to put in plus to indicate it's a, the size of the partition rather than the cylinder number and one g for one gigabyte and you'll notice I've got an error there because this is such an old version of FDisk and it's before multi gigabyte or large gigabyte and certainly before terabyte sized disks were available that FDisk doesn't understand what uh, number uh, or what dimension a G is or gigabyte is. So it's got to be in megabytes or kilobytes as it suggests in the example there. So I need to put in 1,024 megabytes, which is equivalent of a gigabyte. So that's that first partition installed. So you can see that that ranges from cylinder one to cylinder 131. So that's perfectly capable of being booted by Lilo. So now I'm going to uh, change the type of that partition, press F3. And I'm going to tell the system that I want it to be a DOS partition and press enter. And you can see it's identified it as 16 bit. It's going to format it as, and it's a partition that's 32 megabytes uh, because there was a DOS um, version change where partitions couldn't be any bigger than 32 megabytes. So now I want to create another partition and I'm going to create a boot partition for our Linux systems now. So I'll just take the next partition. So starting cylinder is the next available one. And I want this to be, um, say, 128 meg, which is way over the top for the size of a boot partition for a distribution at this time. But if I'm going to be installing other copies of Linux from scratch or maybe even other versions of Linux and I want to share the boot partition between them then um, it's probably not going to be particularly big. So that's going to be 128 megabytes. Press continue. That's defaulted to a partition or a file system type of native so that's okay that's ext2 that'll be. Now I want to create a swap partition, so F5, and I want to create a primary partition again. The next available one is HGA3. Starting cylinder is the next available one. You can see the previous one was 148, so it's selected the next available one. And I'm just trying to think about uh, potentially what do I want to do on this machine if, in terms of compiling, how much swap space would I need? Um, the machine's only got 64K, and if I was to compile a modern GCC, that could pro possibly need anything up to a gigabyte per core to achieve um, a compile. It's generally the linking stage that swallows up memory. So um, I'm going to go with that figure. Uh, it's unlikely that I'll ever need that, but the fact is that I've created and reserved that space. Um, so it's best to do it now rather than to have to chop and change later. So I'm going to select a one gigabyte partition. And that's going to be a swap partition. So I need to press F3 to tell it as a swap partition. And I've got an information message saying you want to use a swap partition bigger than 128 megabytes. Linux is only able to maintain 128 megabytes as a swap partition. It's recommended not to use a swap partition bigger than 128 megabytes. Okay, so we've got a problem here where 
it seems that the version of Linux, which is 2.2, whatever, 2.2, um, cannot or does not use a partition size greater than 128 meg. And it suggests that using a swap partition bigger than that may cause problems as it's not recommended. So because I know that in future more modern Linuxes, um, it is possible to have a bigger swap partition. And as I say, there's a possibility that I will actually need a bigger partition. I'm going to have to change that to one to eight megabytes to keep this kernel suite, but also reserve the space to reallocate it for any future, any newer kernels that I install. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna leave that as it is for the moment. I'm going to allocate the last partition because we're on MBR, there's only four partitions allowed in the um, head, in the header of the MBR. There's only room for four um, because I believe they get stored in the first boot sector of the disk. Uh, what I'm going to have to do is to create an extended partition because I need, I still need two more partitions. I need one for the SUSE system, which we're installing currently. And I also need one for the Linux 1.0 partition that we'll be installing in the future as well. So I'll create an extended partition. We've got the final available partition. And this time I want to allocate the whole of the remaining disk space as the extended partition. Otherwise I won't be able to access um, anything that I don't allocate as part of the extended partition. So you can see there it's created that. Um, by the way, this is the partition number. So if you created partition types on an MBR before, you'll recognize 83 as being a standard uh, Linux file system, uh, the number for the standard Linux file system, and 82 as being the standard Linux swap system. So I've created the extended container, if you like. I now need to create the extended partitions within that container. So once again, I do F5 to create. <clears throat> now I'm creating a logical partition. Again, it's defaulted to the next available or the first uh, available cylinder. And now I want to allocate some space. <clears throat> so for SUS, um, if you wanted to install the complete system, all the packages, um, I can't remember exactly how much space you'd need now. Um, eight gigabytes should be sufficient if you want to have a, a dabble around with it. So I'll put in 8096 megabytes and put the plus in in front. Um, yeah, I can't remember for sure. That should be enough. Um, but if you've got the space, you, you may as well make it a lot bigger, um, just to be sure. I'm not going to be installing the complete lot, so eight eight gigabyte is going to be way way over what what's actually needed. So that is the um, system for the. SUS, so that's going to be the host system. I now need to create a partition for the new LFS 1.0. So I'm going to give that um, two gigabytes, I think. Give myself, again, plenty of space. I've got plenty of room. There's no point in being um, tight on these, um, on space when you've got, got plenty to hand out. Um, as far as the Linux from scratch system goes, the sources are about 80 megabytes and the installed systems, as I remember, about two or 300 megabytes. So it really is a tiny system. Um, so two gigabytes is going to be, uh, sorry, two gigabytes, not terabytes. Is going to be way over the top what's required, but as I say, there's, there's no harm in having all that extra space for, um, you know, maybe sorting something else out within the partition. So I'll allocate that. 
and that should be it so what i need to do now is go back to the linux swap petition now what i've done here is i've created as you know a um a partition that was a gigabyte in size but we've been told that a gigabyte is too big and 128 megabytes is the maximum that a swap can safely be on this version of the kernel so what i'm going to do is do f4 to delete that so you can see that that gap's still there. We've got cylinders consecutively until we reach 148, and then there's a gap, and it jumps to 280. So what I need to do is to create the new partition, primary partition, HGA3, because that's the one that's missing. Start the cylinder, you can see 149, that's correct. That carries on from the end of HGA2. But I'm going to tell it that I want to allocate just 128 megabytes. Uh, to this partition so that means now that there's still a break in the sequence because um, you can see that the swap partition which says Linux native at the moment let's just change that before we get confused so change type of three swap partition we haven't got the error now but you can see that the numbering is still got a gap in it and that's the gap that I can allocate in future when I am allowed to create a larger swap file for when I do need well, sorry not swap file swap partition for when I do need that extra swap space so that means that that is now reserved for a bigger swap uh, Suze will ask us if we want to allocate that that missing space we've got to make sure that we answer no because that will cause all sorts of problems with the um, installation. So that's done. I'll just review what I've done. So I've got a DOS partition. I'm going to reserve there. That's going to be the boot partition. That's the swap partition. I've got an extended container partition. And then within that, I've got a um, 8 gigabyte um, partition for SUSE and a two gigabyte partition for our target linux from scratch 1.0 so i'll just press enter there to carry on yes i want to write this and you can see how long this takes normally this would be done almost inst instantaneously so again i'm not sure if it's the hardware if it's the script that's slow or the software that just runs slowly i don't know but um using this old software and hardware does require a bit of patience in places okay so now it's saying the following swap partitions were found on your system please choose the one you want to use during the installation all data on this partition will be lost so hga3 is the correct partition for the swap we've told it it's going to be a swap drive so it's recognized that so now it's formatting again normally this would be almost instantaneous and for some reason it's taking time all the disk utilities seem to take a, a long time accessing the disk and the only thing i can think of is because of mfm drives used to come shipped from the factory with errors that was printed on a label on the top of them and you still had to format them to find any further errors um, so I can only imagine that the format program is double checking for errors and that's why these disk utilities are taking such a long time. So it's returned us to this select the hard disk um, pop up. We've done with the partitioning. We don't want to allocate the whole hard disk because we've got our own partitioning scheme on, on there. So just move over with the right arrow to continue and press enter. Now we've got to specify what file systems we've got uh, we want to allocate so straight away i can see there's a problem where it's decided to pick up hda6 as the root partition by the looks of it um so what i'm gonna do Um, it's strange that it's not listed these in um, just the normal numerical order and that it seems to have allocated them in the order it wants to use them. Um, so we've got to be careful here. So what I'm going to do is for HDA6, which is going to be our target Linux Scratch system, 
I'm going to press F6 and tell it to not format that because I don't want the, the system installed on that partition. I want it installed on HDA5. So I need to, um, I don't need to press F6 there because as you can see underneath the format column, it's going to do a normal format. Um, HDA2 is the um, boot partition. So I'm going to leave that. I want that formatted. And as you can see, the file system is going to format as is ext2. Um, I believe ext3 came out around this time, but this version of SUSE doesn't seem to have that option. Um, if I press F6, it's just got normal format or do not format as the options, not what type of um, uh, file system to put on there. Uh, and the DOS partition, that's grayed out. I can't format that, so that's just going to be an empty... Um, in fact, there's no choice there, actually. It looks like it is going to format it. Um, but not really concerned about that at the, at the moment. The other thing we've got to do is use F4 to allocate mount points for these partitions. So this particular... Let's start with this one. This one here is going to be the root. So if I press F4 and press Enter there, you can see the mount point for that partition has come up there. And if I press F4 there and tell it that that's going to be the boot mount point, and that should be everything that I need to do there. So now I'll press Enter to continue, and it's saying the following file systems will now be created according to your selections. All data on the partitions will be lost. The installation will exit if you do not format now. So do you want to start the creation of file systems? Well, we've got no option, really. We've got to let it go ahead and format them because it says the installation will just exit. So we'll just double check. HDA5 is the Linux from scratch, sorry, is the SUSE 6.1 root file system. HDA2 is the uh, boot uh, file system. And HDA1 is the DOS file system, which I'm not going to be using in this project, but it's there ready if I do decide to use it. So I'll just press enter there. And you can see it's now creating um, the file system on HDA5. So I'm glad that I told it not to format HDA6. Otherwise, the file system may have gone on there unwittingly. Um, I'll have to format that when the system is installed. So like I say, this takes a little while. Um, if you do Alt F2, we're on virtual terminal one at the moment. If I press Alt F2, there are other screens which you can access. Alt F3, um, you can see. In fact, there's a bit there about the, oh yeah, this is quivering quite a lot here. Um, the maps that are loaded. So although it's loading the US map again, um, it does actually install the correct map uh, at boot up. Uh, Alt F4. There's some information there from, looks like the startup, Alt F5 and Alt F6. So there's no other further information. I thought there might be an output of what's happening. So while that's been formatting, it's now gone into YAST proper. And this is the menu you normally get when you run YAST from within the um, installed system. And Basically, what you've got here is you've got uh, some options to load some default configurations. You've got an option here to modify particular packages. So you can add and delete individual packages here. Um, there's an option here to check dependencies. It will try and resolve dependencies of the packages and, and notify you what additional packages need to, need to be installed. And there's a few other options here, like the what if, if you want to try doing different things. Um, you can view the packages and information about them, uh, install and delete packages, and then go back to the main menu. So by default, if I do load configuration, you can see the default system you get is um, between 220 and 700 megabytes. So a gigabyte is, um, or a minimum of one gigabyte is suitable for a SU system. Uh, and as you can see at the top, almost everything is over four gigabytes. So uh, an eight gigabyte partition would be 
more than enough with lots of room to to move so default system you can just press space to select that and add will add all the packages in that um, package series if you like to the existing selection replace will ignore what's currently selected and just replace it with the packages that are selected by that option so i'll just do replace here it shouldn't change anything because that is the default that's normally selected um, i'm not going to modify anything else like i say i've come across problems before when i've tried to include other packages um, whether it's me not using the system correctly or um, whether it is bugs which it probably more likely is because like i say this is not perfect this installation script um, i don't know but it's just safer to go go with the defaults um, change create configuration let's have a look, quick look in there yeah this is where you can select packages so i'm not going to go into that we'll see that when the system's installed i'll just press escape and i'll go straight to start installation that cyan screen that appeared there was the dependency resolver and obviously because we've selected a default selection there there are no dependencies to resolve and you can see that it's reading packages off the cd drive and is actually installing them at the moment so this will just take a few minutes it didn't take too long the bulk of the default um, packages come off the first cd and i seem to remember there's one or two off the second and possibly a couple off the third as i remember <clears throat> so just wait for that to finish
Okay, so that's the first CD that's completed. So I need to swap over to the second one. And it's worth mentioning that Suzy's, um, apart from this um, installation, Suze just seems to assume that the CD drive or CD disc or one of them is always available. So when we go in to install other packages, um, it's best to ensure that the CD is already in the drive. Otherwise, um, if it can't find the CD, it just says that it can't find the um, location of the source files. So it's um, just worth ensuring that the, the CD is available in the drive whenever uh, you run YAST. And there's no concept of mounting or unmounting, it's just when you've done YAST, um, you know, when you come out of it, you just remove the disk, there's no waiting for it to unmount or anything, it just accesses it as it needs it. Okay, well that is actually more packages than I remembered were installed off CD2, so it's not a problem, we're nearly done now, there's only 14 left. So move on to disk 3. Just wait for the CD drive to access the disk. And I'll press enter. Um, and as you may have seen, um, 
X Windows is installed and there's Netscape being installed so I'll, I'll configure and run that just in case you want to use that to install ok we're going to CD4 <laughs> um, during your own installation but uh, just bear in mind that you won't be able to um, do some stuff uh, once you boot into the Linux from scratch system in a similar way as you do at the moment there's a point where um, with BLFS, you, you boot into BLFS and you haven't got any remote access up, up to a certain point unless you've made arrangements for that. So I'm not sure how much would, would be possible to do um, of the build, uh, but you certainly wouldn't be able to do all of it through the graphical front end. So CD4, that's in, it's reading that now. Okay, yeah, this is a demo for an office suite, I think, that's on the a paid for office suite. So it's probably unnecessary to have, could be deleted if you're tight for space. Okay, so that's the installation complete. Um, all I need to do now is to select the main menu option. And of course it wants CD1 back in there. So in that goes. And you might think it would be a good idea to leave CD1 in there all the time, but what will happen is every time you boot the computer, it will try and boot the CD drive. So um, once we've set up SUSE, you probably won't need it anymore. So that's in. Let's press Enter. Right now it's asking us to choose between one of two kernels that are supplied with the, with the distribution. There's an older version 2.0 there, which I can't say I've ever used. Um, but uh, the default one 2.2.7 as it says recommended and supported uh, the current version versions of Linux that are out at the time were the 2.2 series um, it mentions there the 2.25 kernels many new features and is recommended for most users so I presume when version 6 came out that was version 2.25 and then 6.1 has been updated to 2.27 but they've not updated the text so I press enter there now it wants to know what type of support 
uh, the kernel should have to match the drive control. If you have some IDE drives, simply choose the default EID kernel. If you have a SCSI adapter, select the matching kernel. For any additional information about boot kernels, use the help system, which is F1. You may use F2 to change the destination path of the kernel. F3 may be used to change the destination of the config file. So you can see this kernel that's going to be installed is going to go into boot. That's where we want it. And the .config file is going to go into what was the standard place for um, kernel sources at the time, which Linux from Scratch book suggests, the modern Linux from Scratch book suggests is not the recommended place. But in, in this time, user source Linux is where the kernel sources were kept. And that's where a default a copy of the config file to configure the kernel if you want to rebuild it uh, or if you need to rebuild it even uh, it's going to be stored so as I said previously there's two um, module disks for EIDEs and it does look like the second one is for special chipsets there are some uh, like custom if you like chipsets um, and likewise if you've got a SCSI adapter with specific requirements, then uh, there's all these here. So I'll just select the standard EID kernel, it's what most people want, press enter. And it says it recommends creating a boot disk. You can actually boot a rescue system off of the uh, first SUS installation disk. So I've never used that, so I'll just say no there there's also the floppies if you've got them and you can you've got the capability to boot off a floppy which if you've got a contemporary machine will almost certainly have a floppy drive in it but I, i've found that that's never been really necessary the the live um, rescue system is perfectly sufficient so i'll just do no there do you want to configure the linux loader linux uh, sorry the linux loader lilo is the if there's already a running Lilo configuration installed and you want to continue using it, you should answer no. Well, there's no bootloader because it's a fresh disk. So I'll press enter to configure it. Um, I've got no parameters to add to the boot line. Uh, maybe if it's a SCSI boot, I might want to. Uh, just accept the master boot record as the place to install it. Uh, that's sufficient. And you don't need to adjust, unless you want to adjust the boot delay, you might want to leave that at 10 seconds because as you'll see, we'll need to uh, change the default of uh, the boot from SUS to Linux from scratch. So 10 seconds gives us a chance to get our head together and uh, type in the right thing. So there's no entries at the moment. So what I'm going to do is to create a new config and configuration name, I'll call it SUS 6.1. And we're going to boot Linux and we're booting HDA5. And we don't need to select anything else there. So we'll just press enter. And I'm going to create another config, which is for the DOS partition. And it's correctly picked up that that's the first partition HDA1. And that's all I need to do there. So although the DOS partition has been formatted, there's no system on it because I haven't installed anything. But the options there uh, will be pre-configured, ready for me to boot into. So that's all I need to do. So I'll just press the tab arrow to tab down to continue and press enter. Here's the output of the Lilo command. So it's just run Lilo to write this information. Um, and you can see the star next to the first entry, SUS, is going to be the default one that boots. So if we start the machine and we don't do anything, it will boot SUS 6.1 automatically. Um, and we'll have to type DOS uh, manually to override that. So I'll just press enter there. That looks all right. Now I need to set a time zone. So I need to look for Europe, London for myself. And obviously you need to select whatever time zone you're in. 
So I just press enter there. Have you set the system time of your computer to GMT or is it set to local time? Well, usually if you're du dual bo booting with um, MS-DOS or Windows, you need to set it to local time. Um, MS-DOS hasn't got any concept of time zones. So in this case, it should be sufficient to leave it as GMT, otherwise known as UTC these days. So I'm going to select GMT. Host name, I need to give this a host name. So I'll just call it P233 for Pentium 233. Domain, if you haven't got one, you can leave it blank. I'll use my mynet.org. Right, this keyboard has got a bit of a problem with repeating keys. So occasionally I'll see a double character appear. It's not me, it is the keyboard. So press enter there. Uh, I want to connect to a real network because I want to access this remotely. So I'll select real network. I highly advise you to set up um, yours this way if you're following through with this. Uh, otherwise, if you use loopback only, you won't be able to use the network to transfer data at all. Although you have to bear in mind, you're on an old machine. It, it could be or it will be vulnerable uh, to anything and anything if you do connect it to the Internet. If you can get connected anywhere, as I say, most websites now are HTTPS. Um, but maybe some of those dodgy websites are the ones that aren't, uh, don't have HTTPS. So I'll select real network. It's um, ETH0 is the type of device that I want to use, an Ethernet adapter. The IP address, I'm going to change that to 37 for this computer. Net mask, accept the default, and my gateway is that. And you'll obviously have to put in your own IP address depending on what your own network configuration is. Put your own values in there. Continue there. Starting on that D will enable others to connect to network services, installing or server, e.g. Telnet, Finger, FTP. It's also needed for printing as well as formatting the man pages in the SUS help package. So yes, I do want that because I want to access the machine remotely. Should port map be started at boot time. All services require RPC, require the program to be running. Um, so I'm not sure if that's needed or not. So I'm just going to start it anyway in case it is needed. I don't think it is, but just in case. Um, I'll start the NFS server. Very unlikely that I'll need it, but I might as well set it up to have it use that um, just in case. Okay, I, well, I'm not going to be posting any um, email or anything, uh, but I might as well just leave that as the default. Do I wish to access a named server? Yes, I do, because I want to access other machines on my network. So I'll just need to put in the IP address of, well, this is my own internal uh, name server. Um, if you do plan on accessing the internet, then you'll need to put in your uh, name server that your modem uses. Uh, I don't re really recommend it, though. Um, it's probably best just to leave that blank. Um, or just configure it for your own uh, setup. Please enter the IP address of your name server. You can add more domain name servers by modifying the etcresolve.conf file. So I'll just accept that. We can check that afterwards to make sure that's been set up correctly. So now we're going to select what type of hardware is connected to the ETH0. So it's not PCM CIA, it's actually a PCI version of the NE2000 adapter I've got. Don't need to set any module options. Some network adapters will need to have module options configured to get them to work to the correct address or use the right interrupt. So I'll just press continue there. The network software is now configured. The modifications will become active after the next boot. To press enter. Send mail configuration. Um, again, like I said, I'm not going to be using this to send or receive mail, so I'm just going to tell it not to bother installing that. So now after all that, it's running through and modifying all the appropriate configuration files for all the settings we've just set. Press enter continue, and it says the base system has been successfully installed. This new installed system will now be started in order to commit the installation. 
So what happens here is that it does actually start the Linux system without rebooting. It's not actually rebooting at the moment. And then when it's idle, it'll start running some scripts, um, which I think are to do with man pages it creates. Uh, and I think it does tell us this. And if you interrupt that process, it will just try to start it the next time you reboot the machine and the next time it's kind of idle. So you can see it's booting scripts. Right, so it says welcome to Suze Linux. We now need to set up a password for the root. Uh, obviously, if we don't uh, set a password, we can just uh, press enter. And I presume you'll just access root without having to set a password. So it's probably a good idea to set a password here. Right, because I've set an extremely short password, it's prompted me three times. Yeah, it says here Yast has got some things to do. So we just start Yast. So it's automatically starting Yast again. Do I want to create an example user? Yes, I do, because I want a, an ordinary user to uh, access the system with. So I'll call it kernel text, give it a password. And well, you can give it a description. I'll just accept that. Continue. I haven't got a modem, so no, I wouldn't like to set it up. Um, I have got a mouse, so because uh, like I say, I will be showing you the GUI quickly. Um, and I believe GPM, the um, text based mouse cursor and selection, is installed, so it could be useful to use with that. So, yes, I do. And it's just a Microsoft compatible serial mouse, so I'll just press enter to accept the default. It's on the serial port zero. Uh, GPM, uh, yeah, here it is, is a program that lets you use the mouse to copy and paste text between the virtual consoles. Yes, if you want to run this pro program automatically at the boot time. You may encounter problems with X386, which is X Windows, when running GPM with a bus mouse. So I haven't got a bus mouse, so it doesn't matter. So I'll just press enter to get GPM booted up at boot time or started at boot time. GPM was started, you experiment with moving the mouse to and fro over the screen. Please check whether the cursor follows your movements. Try to select text. Do you wish to keep the current configuration? So there's me moving the mouse. And yes, I can select text as well. So that looks like that all works correctly. I'll keep the configuration. So it's just accessing the CD drive again. All installed packages now initialized. Yes, will terminate now. So here's this message saying these scripts have been started or have to be started. They'll be started in one minute. You can find a log file, which will also be printed on console, virtual console nine. You can now already use your system. If you shut down the system before the scripts are finished, they are executed again at the next startup. So just press enter. And there it is rebooting the system again without actually restarting the machine. And there's the logon. So I'm going to log on with my ordinary user that I set up. Okay. And there it is. I'm in. So I can try and run Yast. It won't let me run that because it's a privileged program. So I'll have to become the root. And now I can run Yast. And as you can see, this is similar to uh, the menu, Yast menu we had before. You can see in particular the media, it's located straight away that the um, install installation disk is in that drive HTC. So what I want to do here is just to install a couple of extra packages which are required to install Linux from scratch 1.0 successfully um, while I'm talking actually the hard disk light is flicking on and off so if I switch to console 9 you can see these scripts are running in the background 
So I'll switch back to console one. And what I want to do here is to, uh, by the way, if you find that you've picked the wrong network adapter, um, this is the menu that you want to go into adjustment for installation. And uh, no, it's not that one. It's system administration and integrate hardware into system. And down the bottom here, you can select configure and there's that screen we saw where we picked the hardware device. So that's the uh, way to access if your network adapter doesn't appear to be working um, and you've obviously selected the wrong driver. So I'm going to choose install some packages, uh, add them in. Now, I was a bit unsure about the first one, uh, which was get text. It's not installed by default. It's the like the internationalization package. Um, and the reason I was unsure about it was that several packages seemed to install OK without it. And then one package, I got an error. And by entering disable NLS on the um, configure line, it allowed the package to work. So I thought, ah, oh, maybe get text should be installed. So I installed get text and everything worked then for that package. And then I got a similar error on the later package, even though get text was installed. And it made me wonder whether get text should be installed or not. And also whether disable NLS should be added to every command. It's not mentioned in the book, but the only reason I think that might be the case that it should be done is that in the, Linux and Scratches I started using, which is version 4 onwards, I think, Disable NLS was a default for most packages as there was no uh, internationalization facility in Linux and Scratch at that particular time. So, uh, as I say, I'm not really sure if it's needed or not, but obviously I built successfully built a working system with it installed, so it's something you probably want to do as well and I'm going to do now. So if I go to change the installation and I need to go to uh, development, is it? Yeah, there it is there. Tools and National Language Support. So just press space bar on that one and then press F10 and that that's uh, selected. Uh, the other package we'll need is called Alien, and that's under AP, so programs that don't need X. And this is because, as you can see, it's a Perl script to convert software packages. One of the packages we need to get hold of is um, in a Deb format, a Debian format, so it needs to be converted to a TGZ format. So I'll explain that. Um, how to convert that. So I'll select that, press F10, then press F10 again, and then run start installation. That blue screen again was the dependency checker. And you can see there's no dependencies need to be resolved. It's just gone ahead and installed those two packages. So that should be sufficient. Um, if you type for space, you want to, for example, remove I mean, this AppLexware that got installed. It's only a demo. Uh, there's 200 megabytes there, which is quite a substantial chunk of the installed um, system. You can just either type D on each of these ones that are an I, lowercase I, which means they're installed, or press spacebar twice. The first time it goes to R, which I believe is to re reinstall it. And if you press space again, it goes to D, which is to delete it. So it's quicker just to press D on each one. So I'm going to remove these. Um, not necessarily. I didn't remove these when I uh, built Linux from scratch first time round. Um, and as you can see, I've got six gigabytes free anyway. But if you want to remove them, press F10. F10 again, start installation. And it checks, do you want to remove them? Yes. Now, funnily enough, it does ask you if you want to make a backup. So um, 
modified files will be packed into compressed tar archive and will be stored in the file package number TJ's, TJZ in the directory below. Um, so it does actually create backups, so you won't actually gain the space unless you delete those backups or just do no, I don't want to do a backup. And it will go ahead and remove the packages from the system. Okay, that's all done then. Nothing else to do there. So let's go to the main menu. And each time you go back to the main menu, this script runs, which checks and updates any config file. So it takes uh, about a minute or so to run. It can be quite frustrating, frustrating if you forget about this and you're fiddling around in and out. Um, but it's obviously necessary for it to maintain the, the system. Right, this might be a little bit slower than usual because I think those scripts are probably still running. I oh, know they've actually finished now. It just does seem to be a little bit longer than usual. Maybe they were still running. It's nearly there now. Okay, so that's done. We can now quit Yast. And back to the prompt. So what I'm going to do now is just log out and I'm going to reboot the machine to see if the, a reboot will sort out this display because it's getting quite annoying. Although uh, the next part is going to be done remotely, most, most of the next part, so I won't be able to look at the screen for a while anyway. Um, if it gets any worse, I'm going to have to see if I can find a spare video card to install to see if that makes a difference, uh, rather than use the onboard one. So I'll just wait for this to restart again. The screen will settle down when the VGA is synced up again. I've just remembered to remove the CD drive before it booted. So there's the Lilo boot. You can press tab to see what options there are. And as I say, you can type in DOS to boot DOS, uh, enter, or you could actually type the name SU 6.1. So I'll just press enter. And you can see, yeah, the video has actually settled down now. It's not shimmering like it was before. So it always does a disk check at the beginning and occasionally it does a full disk check because uh, when X2 was the default, there was a countdown for the number of reboots or number of days where a, a check would be done. 
Um, it's not done on X3 or X4 because they're journaled. So that sort of checking is not needed as regularly. So you can see there the network adapter looks like it's been initialized correctly. So that's something I need to check next. So I'll just log in straight as root. Uh, let's try IPA, that doesn't exist. IF config. Yep, there it is there. Ethernet zero. It says it's up. I'm going to ping my server. And that's working. So I've got network connectivity. That's good. Um, what I'm going to do next is to configure the uh, X window system just to show you it working. It's got nothing to do with the uh, Linux from scratch installation. It's just purely a curiosity uh, if you're interested in using the uh, graphical interface. Um, so the SUS has got this. In the similar way we've got YAS to configure the system, they've created this tool called SAX, which is to um, configure the uh, X window system. So you just type SAX. Um, I'm not sure if this should be run as the ordinary user, actually. Let's just uh, try it. Right, OK, so it is the root. Makes sense because I believe it writes a Excel conf file. So it's defaulted to an SVGA configuration. It says if it's not correct to press something there. I missed that. So there's the screen coming up. There's the logo that's part of. Okay, the screen's. Yeah, it looks like I think the resolution's changed there this time, so I'll just synchronize that. That's better. Um, yeah, the logo that's on the front of the box that you saw in the background then, and we've got some menu-driven configuration here to make it a lot easier to config configure X X org or X X. I can't remember what it's called now, but the X window system. So the mouse system, as you've seen already, it's working with, well, let's use the right mouse. Uh, X Windows um, is using Microsoft mouse. You can see it's working anyway from the settings. So that's fine. Any additional properties, you can change the settings there. Um, emulate three buttons. I guess that could be useful. Uh, you probably don't want to change these, it's working fine. So if I press the left button, right button, there's no, oh yes, there is a center button on this one. So um, yeah, but most, my, most of this era didn't have a third button and this one does and it does actually work, which is interesting. So it's useful. So that all looks like it's okay. So I'm just going to apply that and click OK and move on to the next tab, the keyboard. Uh, I'm going to select United Kingdom. Let's see if it, no, it hasn't actually come up. Let's do apply. Yep, that's better. It's actually behaving correctly now. So that that's OK. A 104 key PC. There's not too many options there. So you are limited a little bit, but that should be OK. Um, So I'll click next. Now we go on to the video card. Um, so this is a matrix. Uh, Mystique. So yeah, it's correctly identified. It's got two mega memory. It's still using the SVGA driver which is fine uh, so that should be okay and now i'm going to select the monitor so the monitor that i was using i'll set that one up even though it's not plugged in now it's actually a different monitor 
was a Compaq V50. Now I had some trouble here getting this to operate at a higher video mode um, or even I think it was the bit depth that was the problem. Let's try setting this to 800. See if this works. No, that looks fine. I'll just resynchronize the screen. Yep, that looks fine. Now with this, because it's analog, you get these arrows to configure the size of the displayed image. So if you have an older monitor that hasn't got the uh, settings for adjusting the geometry of the displayed screen, then SAX has got these um, buttons here that you can do it from within the software. So as you can see this square here is just off the top of the screen. It cut, it's out of view. So what I can do is to shrink the vertical size of the screen slightly and I may have to keep resynchronizing here. Looks like it's locked on to that. Okay, yeah. Um, not quite, oh no, it hasn't locked on. It's gone again. Yeah, that's better. It's come back now and I can see the whole of that box now. I can see the whole of that one. So I actually don't need to do much more adjustment. Um, oh, it keeps dropping out the signal now. Let's try it once more synchronizing. Right, hopefully that stays now. So these these ones adjust the actual size of the displayed image and then these ones here just move it within the display area. So I'm not going to tweak anything else because uh, that seems to be working relatively well. Apart from the fact it's lost synchronization again. I think what I'll do is I'll just go back to the 640 by 480. Display. Uh, maybe too much. Even as I move the mouse, you can see the screen is shivering slightly. So there's definitely something wrong with the video card. It seems like a power delivery type thing. So let's try that. Yeah, it is synchronizing again now. Again, it's slightly off the top. So I'll shrink it down a bit. That looks okay. It's lost synchronization again because I've changed the timing. Okay, let's save that. Okay, that looks like that's it. It's just come out, there's no errors or anything. So what I'll do is I'll go in as my ordinary user and start X to run the GUI. And yes, there's the display. It says it's creating a home kernel text desktop. I'll just have to resynchronize again. That's better. And there is the KDE version 1.1 interface. Yeah, this is not going to work. It's uh, synchronized again. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad I'm not working in this environment because it looks like it caused problems. But basically, I think that button's YAST, uh, access to YAST, yeah, it is. Uh, I'm not sure what that is. I'll help file uh, and the menus under here. It's quite a confusing menu. There's all sorts of things everywhere and things in places you wouldn't expect them to be. And for example, Netscape, I couldn't find where that was. Um, well, I did find it eventually, but it was in a place I wouldn't have expected it to be. Um, so probably what's the best thing to do to show it working is if I get console up 
and just type Netscape and yeah this is too small for the screen now can I actually reduce this so I'll just do accept and yeah that's what the internet looked like in 1999 so obviously like I said most places won't work as you see it's tried to go to its home page it's not working because it's just HTTP it probably doesn't exist anyway so what I shall do is I'll go to my server Under the site, yep, that's it there. So you can see I've put on my server to for easy access uh, a copy of the book, which, as I've already mentioned, is in the uh, LFS Museum location. So I'll be able to read this. It's quite annoying that there's no wheel on the mouse to scroll down. So you can see there's a book there to read from. And also there's uh, all the packages that are needed for the build. So these are the ones I downloaded. And for convenience, if I go back these are the packages directly off the um, SUS sources disk. In fact, I should also show you how to access those before we actually start doing the build. Uh, the extra is just the stuff that I didn't consider to be part of the Linux Scratch build um, in that it's the X Windows X386 uh, part of it to get a GUI up and running just for just for sake of it really. Um, if you did want to work within a graphical environment in Linux 1.0. So yeah, that's the just a quick demo of how things used to be uh, 24 years ago. So I'll log out of that. I have to resynchronize this screen because the text has gone all funny it's better right so to get the sources they're in user source um, packages and then a directory called sources and at the moment it's empty so to populate that we'd need to become root go into yast while that's loading, I'll put the disk in ready. The, the first disk, although it's probably not the right disk. And if you go to choose install packages, it's just accessing the CD at the moment. And then change and create configuration. So it's scanning the CD at the moment. And go right down to the bottom to this series ZQ where the source packages are. And if you go into there, this is where all the sources are for the SUSE distribution. So for example, if we wanted to get hold of the uh, GCC package, There it is there for 2.7.2.3. So just select that by pressing spacebar. Um, if you wanted Gork as well, uh, just select that. So um, 
you'll see from the list as we go through what's available um, and or sorry what is required but uh, from Suze uh, as I say you can use all these sources here to build Linux from scratch there's probably one or two packages that aren't on here are not used by Suze that you would have to fetch um, but otherwise 99% of the packages that are used by Linux from scratch 1.0 are available here and as I said before in the initial video the only reason I've downloaded further packages because they're newer and that's what was recommended by the installation instructions to install the latest at the time of publishing so if I keep those as an example press F10 F10 again go to start installation and it'll tell me yeah I need CD5 now CD5 as far as I can remember has only got source packages on it cd4 has got a mixture of source and binary packages on it so in cd5 goes let's wait for the disk to be registered by the drive itself and press continue And it's done so just quit and once again as i said before every time you quit back to the main menu of yast unfortunately whether it's needed or not it goes through this procedure of um i don't know if it's rebuilding or interpreting differencing or what it's doing but it's obviously ensuring that the config files reflect the changes that have been made in yast Okay, that was a bit quicker that time. So now I can quit, come out of root. Now if I do a listing of the sources directory, you can see that there it's put the tarball for Gork, the version that's available to SUSE 3.03, .03, and GCC was the other one we selected, 2.7.23. It's also put a patch in there. Now, I don't know what that patch does. You'd have to look at it maybe to bring it up to certain standards as required by SUSE. It may be updated since 2.7.2.1. Oh, yeah, it's obviously a prior version maybe to bring it up to that version. I don't know. Um, throughout building Linux from scratch, just forget these diff files, forget the patches, just... Um, grab the tar gz files uh, another thing to bear in mind if you do decide to download your own packages make sure you download a .tgz or a .tar.gz file there's no bzip on um, yast as far as i'm aware uh, let's have a quick look uh, There's certainly no other formats such as um, S Z standard or XZ or anything like that. Um, so it's safest just to go with tar.gz. Um, and certainly there shouldn't be a problem given the age of the distribution. Yeah, some artifacts here. That's probably from running the graphical front end. Uh, they've not disappeared. Um, yeah, so I don't know where this would be. I don't think there's a search system here at all. Resorting, let's try that F. All packages. All packages excluding sources. So let's look for bzip. Oh no, it is there, okay. But it's not selected by default. Okay, so you could download a bzip2 file, but it's probably just easier to stick to G, tar G, gz, um, a gzip file. As I say, there will be versions um, always in the gzip format, but not necessarily in the bzip format. But if you do want to use bzip, slightly sl smaller downloads, 
then you'd have to install it. Uh, I suppose I could install that now I'm here. Okay, so back to CD1. Okay, and it's done. Okay, all finished. So that's the SUS installation finished with. The next video will be on the remote computer where we'll be able to start with the Linux from scratch 1.0 installation where I'll be able to copy and paste commands across easily. Various stages it recommends to boot up the system and it gives you a real appreciation of how the uh, Linux boots because initially you configure the bootloader you install a kernel and you effectively just boot that kernel um, and then you start adding bits to it and boot that to make sure those bits work so it gives you an idea a very good idea of how the boot process works uh, in a really but really basic system um, so we'll be switching backwards and forwards between the terminal you can see now and the remote terminal um, but certainly initially most of the build will be in the remote terminal until we get a certain to a certain point um, which is effectively the beginning of chapter 8 in the more modern Linuxes where you've created um, a basic Linux from scratch system but it's not the final system and that when you start building the final system in Linux from scratch 1.0 you've actually you've actually booted into that system and you're just rebuilding packages um, for reasons that will become clear later on. Um, and I'll be endeavouring to do that remotely as well. So there's a point where I'll have to do some configuration installation on the uh, actual machine itself. Uh, but the bulk of the installation, probably between 80 and 90% will be done remotely.